thank you for letting us use your space. And also we are currently inside Carl's, one of our panelists' <laughs> installation with Jonas, so thank you for letting, letting us be in your installation. Yeah, it's really cool. If you get a chance to come back later, and you like check out what it looks like when the <laughs> red <laughs> lights are projected on it. It gets really amazing in here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> social, mental, physical gestures that happen. And maybe even try to get into a point where we can do a bit of a rhythm analysis of a, of a culture. So we have artists, developers, developers of obviously uh, big contributors to the open source movement, which now we introduce in uh, one by one. Uh, so, speaking with Arsin, because that's how my paper goes. <laughs> Arsin on Arsin is uh, from uh, Marshmallow Laser Feast, a uh, London-based experiential uh, studio. And uh, personally, I would like to make a little addition to say, I would say it's the most amplified human content or a human way of being uh, using technologies and apparatus. So, that's interesting through their work. Uh, we have Kyle McDonald, who's right by me. He's working with code and is a great contributor to the arts engineering toolkits like open frameworks and much more. And also has been teaching uh, NYU's ITP, among many other things. Uh, we have Kadi Debian de Meur. That's good, I get that correct. As known as Push One Stop. And uh, she's an uh, interactive media artist who works in uh, audiovisual performances and she performs herself as well. And we have Edwin uh, who is the co-founder of R&DR Studio and one of the lead developers of Open R&DR which is a creative toolkit uh, to create artworks, let's say. Um, and sorry, Caroline. We also have Caroline Tunisa. He's a Utrecht-based visual media artist, researcher, and a curator, co-founder of Deframe, Fiber, and also programs, uh, events, workshops, meetups in creative coding Utrecht. And so we'll, each of them will be presenting their work really briefly, and then we'll be opening it up for discussion. And who would like to go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, or maybe the order of the slides, and here's the... Hi, my name is Kyle, and uh, I think I have some slides. I'm coming from Los Angeles, and uh, like you heard, this is Light Leaks with Jonas Young Young, which would be uh, opening up again at 5.30 after the talks are over. Uh, I just wanted to share some stories. Oh, I guess I should have put the text on the top. <laughs> I'll read it for you. Uh, I wanted to share a quick story of how LightLeaks is connected to an open source process that started in 2008. Uh, this is an excerpt from a piece called Body Traces by Sophie Khan and Lisa Parra. Uh, I saw this piece uh, in 2008 where they're doing some kind of scanning of a dancer's body in 3D and rendering these gestures out. And uh, I was really excited when I saw this because I've never seen anything like this before. And um, I found out that they were using this process called David Laser Scanner, which meant that for every single frame of video, they had to have the dancer stand still for about one minute, and then they would move to the next frame, and the next frame. So it's about, you know, normally we say like one frame per second, ten frames per second, this is one frame per minute. It's a very slow capture process. Um, and I was studying uh, philosophy and computer science at the time, thinking really deeply about very technical things. <laughs> and I thought, 
I have seen someone else do this, and it's much faster. So how did they do it? I saw this video, House of Cards, directed by James Frost, uh, working with Aaron Copeland for Radiohead, and um, I thought, this, this is happening in real time. How is it possible? So I looked it up, and I found this researcher, Song Zhen, who uh, made this structured light scan for Radiohead for to make this music video. Uh, but it cost $50,000 to get one of these. Um, and it was like researchers only and kind of scientists only. So I read more of his research papers and I found out there's nothing special inside this box. Actually, it's just a projector on the left with some kind of heat exhaust and a camera on the right. That's it. No special technology, just a projector and a camera. And I had those, so I kept looking through his papers, trying to understand all of the details of how he built this system and what the code was doing. I built my own, <laughs> literally with a shoebox attached to a projector. So it's kind of dark, but there's a camera on top of the projector with a shoebox and duct tape connecting them. Um, so I had all the ingredients, projector, camera, laptop, and I started coding, and I built a 3D scanner that um, kind of projects a bunch of lines simultaneously instead of the David laser scanner, which just projects one at a time. Um, started capturing some kind of single frames and uh, moved on to capturing moving video. This was an installation with uh, Daito and Zach Lewis and Theo Watson. tutorials in the late 2000s. Um, I posted information about the papers that I used and what inspired me and uh, a lot of code so that people could try it themselves and uh, understand how it worked and recreate what I was doing. Uh, I made a Google group, like a mailing list, so that people could talk about this technique called structured light 3D scanning and we could figure out how to make a better version that wasn't $50,000 so everyone could experiment with it. Um, and these were some of the experiments I saw people making with this toolkit. This one's a mix of some 3D scanning, some 3D modeling.
I would like to use your, uh, yeah. your stuff for sure. Um, my name is Candy Debian Demel. I'm from Montreal. My artist name is Push One Stop. I am uh, actually an interactive media artist, but I really specialize in visual programming and mostly audio reactive visuals. I really like to uh, make my visual bounce with the music. That's basically my main, I would say, um, uh, special thing about me. Uh, I am not a developer like Kyle, I'm a user, <laughs> an artist, but I use, of course, uh, open source uh, in my work. I've done it like since the beginning that I started to do generative design um, with processing pure data, and now I'm more with uh, Touch Designer. Um, so that is the piece I'm going to present actually tonight that is called Interpolate. It's going to be presented in, in the dome of today's art. So I invite, I invite you guys to come at uh, 11 p.m. to watch it. It's a performance that I do with an artist called Wolk. I work a lot in the uh, 360 environment, but I also do uh, other kind of uh, works. Like this is my uh, latest uh, project called Membrane. It's, uh, it's an, an performance, um, but it's also an installation at the same time. So I'm getting more into art objects than uh, performances in uh, my practice. Um, this is more performances that I've done um, in New Tech in Montreal a lot. So I'm going to show you just like quickly like what my work looks like so you can understand a bit more what I'm doing in terms of audio reactivity. <laughs> because you can really build your own stuff. Like it's not like open source, like you don't act, you don't have access to the code, but you can you can use open source language like shaders and, uh, and and that's why I like it so much. It's very powerful. So my project is actually doing sound and visual at the same time using uh, also Maximus P I have to say, but um, mostly uh, touch designer for shading. So this is a project that I did in Montreal for the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal. It was uh, for uh, the Beatles, it was a special expo for uh, the Beatles and uh, it was very 60s. So I thought that shaders were like the best thing you could find for it. And uh, yeah, so it was like running forever. Like that's what I love about generative is that if you don't stop it, it's just never gonna end, right? And then we're gonna show you twice the same thing. That's that's kind of cool. So um, yeah, so this is again like membrane. I just wanted to say that I'm uh, I'm really inspired right now about the mixed realities because, uh, like I said, I work a lot in dome and um, in, in VR projects because I like to be frameless for sure. Like for a visual artist to have no frame, it's it's really amazing. You can like basically do architecture with visual, which is insane. But I think it's really nice to be like in 2018 and to have like now new ways to actually bring the digital inside of our real world instead of having to bring the people inside a digital world, you know? And I think that's for sure the next level. And uh, I'm not the only one, obviously, in, uh, in the industry that is like into like holograms and stuff. But yes, I am into holograms right now. And yeah, like I said, I really like VR. I, I love to work in the 360 environment. And um, I really like to use sensors uh, like you, uh, Kinex, and uh, also voices sometimes. Like this is um, a, an extract from a movie I've done called Zoe, uh, a movie that was uh, uh, directed by Jake Dormus and produced by Ripley Scott. And um, I was lucky enough to do audio reactive visual on the voice of uh, Lea Sidou. And uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna show you quickly. Hello. Oh wow. Hello! I'm here in an empty room, shouting! I'm feeling a little silly! Woo! 
So yeah, I, I think it's really nice. Uh, it opens up a lot uh, to do interactive visual, especially for VFX. I come from the VFX world. I used to be uh, working in movies and uh, VFX for uh, over 10 years before getting into um, interactive. And um, for sure, it's going to be uh, used more and more uh, in, in the VFX world. Uh, this is um, a project I also love to do theater, to do plays. And uh, for this one, I use uh, Kinect and uh, a few uh, different sensors to, uh, to do uh, real-time uh, visuals. So my uh, aesthetic is less is more <laughs> minimalism. I, I, I think there's nothing more efficient than uh, online. And um, you can do crazy stuff like with, I, I mean I love people that do like uh, very like realistic 3D works, for example. But me, in my aesthetic, I am more into what's uh, minimal, and I am very influenced by architecture, um, mostly parametrical design. This is also open source for architects. Um, they use parametrical design uh, more and more, and um, yeah, this as you can see. Um, the obvious. <laughs> I'm inspired by architecture. And uh, yeah, I'm also like in love with geometries. Just wanted to say quickly that I'm a uh, very... So that's my uh, little extract of uh, my project. So you go through this kind of food chain. 
Um, and obviously VR is like the headset is super boring and this technology is ugly and you know it doesn't communicate what's going on. So we had to come up with an eye, like a, a design solution, but also it, it was happening in a forest, so we had to make that waterproof. So and and then when you take this work into galleries, like how do you bring a piece of the forest with you? So this is like real moss and bark, and we like we smuggle them in the states because you can't take plants and stuff. Um, and it kind of like it falls off a piece, and then you get another piece from somewhere else, and now it's a collection of ten different forests living in a helmet. And and the, the the idea was actually going those places, scanning them using architectural tools like LiDAR scanners and then kind of applying the, the scientific uh, kind of facts how those animals perceiving the world into a, a, a narrative where you get to see the same part of the forest through the eyes of those different animals. Um, and so it's, it's more like an exercise of finding this immersion and how do you immerse someone in the, in the age of this like distraction um, Virtual reality is such a luxurious thing for the artist. Like, you allow yourself, as an audience member of audience, uh, to give away your eyeballs, your your ears, and you know beyond that, we are using subtack for haptics and everything. But this is quite rare, unless you know you, you tie them somewhere and just I don't know kidnap people. Otherwise, you don't often get that luxurious kind of private time. So. But from there, how do you turn that into more kind of a collective experience and how that content can be applied to different mediums? And that's one of those exercises, like in the eyes of the animal starting from a headset and then turning into a, a more kind of a larger uh, installation where 50 people can experience it at the same time. Um, I'll be like super quick. Uh, that's more, 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 more. Yes. And then, you know, that, that journey starting from there and we develop certain tools, we put them out there. And one other aspect that I'd like to talk about, uh, probably during the panel, is um, open sourcing the assets because they are culturally significant. Like this is from Sequoia National Park, which is this you know giant sequoia trees living there, 3,000, 3,400 years old, 120 meters trees, giant things, and only 24 percent of it remain in that habitat. So. Actually, beyond the, the artwork itself, the asset that we gathered is culturally significant. And how do we actually open source that asset rather than the work itself or the tool that, that's been made um, to make it whether accessible for artists or scientists or whoever wants to use it, but also give a, like, it's almost digital vault. How can you, well, I don't want to paint that really grim picture, but, you know, if, everything goes in the way that I'm going, we will lose all that stuff in 50 years time. So it's sad to think that the only thing we have from that place is a LiDAR scan of that 3D information, but still at least that might give us some opportunities to uh, reframe the, the Anthropocene uh, in, the, in the form of studies or in you know, the context of art. So that's one thing I'd like to talk about today, um, like open sourcing the assets beyond the artwork itself. Um, and Treehugger was kind of taking different weird places uh, that you can have. Uh, how am I doing the time? I, mean, like, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. No. Ten minutes. <laughs> Shall I continue? Um, but one other aspect was the, the like making of those projects. It's beyond like, my background is visual communication design and you know coming from an AB background. And then with those projects start exploring the multi-sensory aspects of a narrative. And you end up with this weird place that you start designing an emotional narrative journey as a master timeline, then you start assigning those moments to it, which is quite interesting and that's part of the evolution and evolution of the work. Uh, but I'm really curious to see like how multi-sensory aspects can affect our cross-model perception for those artworks and how that can be actually collectively gathered because we still believe that we have five senses like the Aristotelian you know, way of thinking but actually they think there are 33 senses 
So as an artist, can you actually target those other senses more than the others? And ask questions like weird questions. How do we conceive something much larger than us, like a black hole? You know, incredible scientific study is going on. We are listening universe um, for the first time in crazy scales with the gravitational waves. But how do we communicate those large concepts that are so difficult to relate to yourself? Um, and uh, those are some of those snaps from the, the recent work. Um, or, you know, something so much you know, smaller, it's just invisible to you, it's living under the soil and connecting all the trees and everything, and how do you communicate and embody something so different than yourself? And I'm hoping, kind of like asking those questions will allow us to um, expand our conscious experience, so becoming more human by asking those questions can be an opportunity, or at least I wish, uh, in the age of Anthropocene. So, um, well, and questions like that, do you all feel like dream in summer? Uh, and like, you, how do you visualize that? Uh, or what is it like to get that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's nothing to do with open source so far, but uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I'll get back to that. Uh, I think that's it, thank you. Hello, I'm Edwin. <laughs> and uh, well, um, I work for R and R. You are you happen to be in the uh, space of R and uh, This is actually the space that um, uh, we use to to prototype uh, our our work. We often make uh, physical installations, and uh, they they need to be they need to be tested with, with real people. Um, so that's why we. Uh, um, uh, I'm a, uh, somewhere between a, a developer and a designer. And, um, yeah, the work that, that we do uh, at R&DR is, um, it's, it's somewhere between data visualization and interactive installations. And we Please use your mic. Sorry, That's we do right. something with data visualizations and um, uh, interactive installations and we, we like to combine the, the two together. Um, uh, yeah, in our work, we often work with uh, data and also the, the, the tools that um, yeah, show this data. So one example uh, of what, what typically um, yeah, we do in our work, for example here, um, we have uh, scraped uh, like hundreds and thousands of images from uh, Google Street View. I'm not sure if that's legal. Um, normally you would see uh, these images uh, projected on the inside of a sphere and um, here I draw them on, on the outside of spheres. So you get this like, super interesting map that uh, shows a city, uh, how it is yeah, seen uh, through the, uh, the eyes of uh, yeah, the street view machine. Uh, yeah, often a uh, recurring theme in our work currently is uh, drawing maps. Uh, we, do, we do this uh, often on, uh, uh, yeah, based on simulations and also uh, uh, open, open, open data. Uh, uh, much of our work uh, focuses on uh, visualizing uh, flows or things moving in these, uh, in these maps. Um, yeah, we, we try to, to yeah, make uh, interesting uh, visual languages. For these things, we often we start with creating a vocabulary. We turn those vocabularies into systems, and from these systems, we can well, generate these these maps. But we can also uh, yeah, create uh, typographic treatments that work in, in that similar similar or uh, uh, the same system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Software and creating software ourselves plays a, a key role in our work. Um, what, what we notice when you make software is that you 
Phase B never makes up there in a vacuum. You are always uh, working with the, with the work of other people. And one of the, the interesting things that I've noticed in, in my work is that, uh, for example, in the, in the field of machine learning, uh, the way of uh, publishing research uh, and the results thereof uh, has changed from uh, writing a piece of text with a table that says this works really better than what the other people did into uh, uh, yeah, a fully working implementation, open source implementation. So instead of uh, reading one of those publications and thinking, wow, I wish I could do this, but then I have to spend uh, months of uh, recreating the software, you can actually now just, just go on, on, uh, on GitHub and um, yeah, get that code and get it working in, uh, in, in hours time. And that has uh, led to uh, yeah, interesting things that we can do uh, yeah, in our work. Um, a recent interest was um, yeah, the idea of, of yeah, computational models for natural languages. So uh, how, what are ways uh, in which machines uh, can yeah, interpret uh, human language? And here you see uh, the unfolding of a very high dimensional language model into a 2D map. And the idea is that uh, every point represents a word. And in the end of the, of the process, you will have points that are similar in meaning as defined by some magic machinery. Uh, they are placed together. And uh, to create this, we have, we have used uh, openly uh, released data pretty complex uh, uh, algorithms to, to do this mapping and also the, um, yeah, the machinery to, to actually um, yeah, read, read a lot of text and, and build a, a, a language model. Um, we, we try to use such language models to yeah, create software that could maybe uh, understand the, the user a bit better. And one of these things in uh, the language model that you have seen before uh, is that it has uh, magically learned uh, word analogies. So uh, what you could do in this, in this model is uh, find the direction between the points for Italy and Rome. And you would get like a, a line, but a line in very high dimensional space. And you could move from Italy to uh, you could replace it with France, and it would point out that uh, it would point to Paris. So it has, uh, just from reading text, it has in a very strange way uh, learned this relation between uh, country and, and capital. And of course, this is like the, the classical thing that, that, that they show in this research because this works pretty well. Uh, but what I find interesting is how this model completely breaks apart when you uh, ask for um, yeah, things that are not necessarily uh, described in the text that this algorithm has processed. So, for example, the color of objects um, is kind of strange. <laughs> recent uh, release of uh, a product called Danispose, which is yeah, very good in at understanding the, yeah, the shape of the, of the human body in, in video material. Uh, this is a, a small experiment that um, yeah, draws with, with uh, the extraction of, of a human shapes from, from video. So it draws like this temporal Culture. Yeah, and uh, recently uh, we have released a, an open source uh, yeah, piece of software, and it's the software that uh, we use as a studio to, to create yeah, practically all of our, of our work with. And yeah, this has been, been published three months ago. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's benefits for uh, for yeah, all sides involved. So there's there's uh, yeah, for people who are interested in, in these kind of code, there's now uh, an actual choice. And for us, uh, it's it's become a really nice uh, vessel to to 
embody our uh, our knowledge. So we can now um, also release um, yeah some of the work that we made as as code and um, uh, yeah we can teach people about uh, what we do. Yeah, work. 
and it's a node base, so you, uh, you use nodes and connect them with the, with cards, and um, yeah, we, you, everybody does contributions, and uh, uh, there's really a, a live um, uh, how do you call it community around it, which I really love. And a research <coughs> that I did is into um, multi-user virtual reality because I think shared experiences are better than having one alone. Especially yeah, you, when you go into the dome, it's really nice that you're like with many people experiencing this, and I think there's a kind of uh, a magic to that. So this I tried to uh, bring it in, or I did bring it into an installation. And so what um, what touched us to your experience and. Uh, we discovered that, yeah, when you can touch another person in VR, it really uh, helps uh, the virtual um, environment to become more immersive, or you're more present in the virtual environment. So, yeah, using your whole body and not only your head, I think that's really important. And it's also really fun. <laughs> Uh, we're, we use the Kinect to scan the body, so you can actually see your own body and the other person in VR. And with this experience, this uh, uh, installation is made where you can walk through uh, a virtual environment using your body. Yeah, it really helps you get into it and make it feel more real. And this is uh, something that's on today's art this year. It's on the Rotterdam projection mapping on the. Um, I lost the name of the building. Paul <laughs> Harlem. Harlem, yes. And um, with the. Yeah, there are videos actually, if you can click. For the, um, for the projection mapping, and <coughs> on the right you see some uh, text generated by a uh, render. <laughs> so uh, yeah, take a look when it's uh, when it's dark tonight. Uh, yeah, because this doesn't show what it is. <laughs> okay, next slide. Oh, that's me. Um, yeah, something fell out of there, but uh, this is. What I also like to do is uh, give workshops, and we created a um, uh, Leolane that's a, a program for teachers to teach children how to code, and especially code creatively or express them creative, themselves creatively through code. And yeah, I think it's really important that they learn not to, that it's, uh, you can use it to make art and not only uh, create applications or websites. Oh, that's there. <laughs> um, in collaboration with me, that's an angel thing. And also, uh, I organize Creative Coding Utrecht, where we try to uh, get the community of coding people together and uh, share their work and in meetups and organize uh, workshops. And now we have an exhibition coming in October, Hello World. Uh, in Utrecht, so all come. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then we also um, show the, the work that came out of uh, workshops. And also uh, Code of Matters, that's uh, the 27, where we invited uh, artists and scientists to uh, imagine a future and um, yeah, speculate about where we're going and uh, yeah, where it can go. So we'll come to that too. <laughs> and yeah, Fiverr is, uh, we started to organize it because we were with a group, group of people and we felt like ah, we have to make something. And we went to festivals and like, wow, well, we can do this too. And so we did in Amsterdam and uh, yeah, pretty cool stuff are, is coming out of that. And especially it's nice that digital communities come together and meet each other in real life, which I think is really important to uh, yeah, inspire each other and uh, bring this field to uh, another level. So, 
there's our three websites. Thank you very much. <laughs>
then the community has become very homogenous, and it's mostly young white guys that are working on these toolkits. Like VVV is built just by guys, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Open Frameworks early on was really just men processing as well. Um, it's kind of similar across all of these, and it's true also if you look at uh, outside of the arts, like Linux, if you look at any of these open source libraries, it's a kind of consistent problem. And um, so now what I'm realizing is uh, the thing that open source communities can do that's different than what a company can do is not make a better toolkit, but actually build a better community if that's what they're focused on. So I'm really excited right now about some projects like P5.js where the focus of the project is actually to build a community that's very inclusive and diverse and has people from all different backgrounds working on it. Um, so my reason for being interested in open source has changed. I used to think it was the best technical solution. Now I think it's possible for it to be the best kind of community-oriented solution. I would have something to say about that um, as a user because I find that open source can sometimes be very difficult for people that actually don't have a background as a, you know, programmers, like I'm, I'm not a developer. And the problem with open source since the beginning is, is the usability, like the user interface. And that's why we like to use VBV, such designer, processing, it's become, it, it becomes actually accessible to 95% of the population. You don't have to be like this super like sophisticated user to, to use it. Um, and I think that it's, it's also, I love open sources, but I think it's also very interesting to see uh, the branch that is like more, I would say like in the economic term, freemium, which is the software is free, but if you want to use it and do like very like big projects with it, you have to pay a certain amount. And that's what's happening with Touch Designer and, and, and the other one is that it's free, if you want to download it, you can. You can do like crazy projects with it. You can control like lights, DMX, like it's. But if you want to do HD or if you want to control like servers, uh, now you have to pay. And and I'm not against that because I think that what it does is that it actually gives the support, and it also has the community. Touch Designer has a huge community. We all share our setups, or our toolkits, like you said, and that's that's basically how I have learned. And um, and I give my my tool my, my toolkit as well. Like we all like build like little components that we can share after that on the forum. And this is how we learn and how we can like actually like build something. But it's something that is like reliable and very stable and actually something that I can understand, you know, <laughs> which is important to say. I think yeah. I agree that um, it's really nice to have uh, that they make it usable and uh, and I really also support that that we support the the programs in uh, in yeah, making it accessible to artists and uh, um, yeah so I agree. I like that you said that's how you learn and that's actually one of the aspects that I'm interested to know more about your ideas is if you have a maybe I don't know children <laughs> if like let's take a four-year-old child and the type of education that we want to envision for this person is it the type of education where for example codes are shared and they can experiment and then they can maybe even be engaged with communities where they have access to spaces like this because it's not only the software that actually cannot make break through uh, out of the computer in the creative fields, it's mostly projects or like installations or interactive works like these that people can learn through. So I'm maybe asking what are the types of gestures so when we interact with the process of learning from them, what are they turning us into? What are the new sets of values that we can explore as, as users and, and what that might mean for the future of education, maybe. Anyone? Anyone? Let's <laughs> 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 for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just to reiterate that part, yes, future is open source, and they, they do 
there is a sad story, obviously. We are looking at, you know, 50% of the, the workforce losing their jobs within the next 50 years because of automation. And the, the absolute optimist in that scenario is what all those people will do in their free times. So it's like, is there a world where we can actually establish more homogeneous, you know, like, you know, more diverse communities around those learning rituals and within the open source community that can have a better future in that sense. So it's like how to build that, I have no idea. Um, it's a like, community building exercise point of view. But actually there's like quite optimistic thing there where the, the rituals around interacting with those tools, obviously you have to have the free time to do something, add something on top of what you know and that allows you to do that, but do you have the affordance of having free time to learn that thing? It's just like you know multifaceted issue that can you know resolve as a as a as an optimistic future exercise. So in that sense I'm um, uh, I think the the the, the most interesting thing to me is this, you know, as an artist, uh, the, the previous reference point to our existence was to be stamped by an institution, a cultural institution. Open source tools or the artists who are working with code uh, showed another way of existing and propagating your work beyond itself, beyond the stamp of a, 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 an institution. So I think that's, to me, the most interesting part of your work can live in different forms, whether it's a piece of code or as a final you know, print on someone's wall. Uh, but uh, how it propagates from there is actually showing us a different future and also it's almost like shaking the, the kind of dinosaur institutions a little bit. Um, so I think that's the, the behavioral change that I can see quite positively for the future. And that's one of the gestures that I feel like artists can embrace more uh, more than what it used to be. I don't know if it was yeah, no, 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 no. about I met some people too. Um, <laughs> share what you do, it's, the, it, I'm guessing it also keeps you on your toes a bit because you have to constantly innovate <laughs> because now it's not, it's not yours anymore so the authorship or the claiming of your creative output or your creative work is changing in a way we were talking about that also a bit like how does it play into the ego and how do you want to like immortalize what you do, what comes out to the world and now it seems that it's more that artists are becoming teachers in a way and they have more claim through the enabling and the facilitation of other people and to teach and how to kind of uh, integrate them within the community and that's thinking, that's kind of looking back, is their life's artwork rather than all the individual works that they created and how how anxious does it make you, or doesn't it make you anxious at all to share your like wild wow, work? And, and as amazing as it is to be kept on your toes and like constantly in innovate, but would that get just the expansion of this? Uh, would it get a bit too competitive, or what do you feel about it? Do you very comfortably share? Or what's your thoughts on that? I feel pretty strongly that if your work is being copied or ripped off even, then you just need to make better artwork. <laughs> uh, and that you're doing something that's not very personal, it's maybe too generic. Uh, <laughs> um, but like, there's also, sometimes it means just doing something that only you feel comfortable doing, like, or have the opportunity to do in some cases, like the source code for this project is online, but no one tries to recreate it. <laughs> They were able to reproduce the work that you should be okay. So yeah, I mean, no one, no one tries to like it, copy a performance piece from Yoko Ono. If they do, you know, it doesn't work because they're not her, and she has her own 
unique take on what it means to perform that piece, right? So I mean, it's an important aspect of the, the remix culture, let's say, that actually it's an is more creativity. Well, thank you for all of that. I think we're up in our time of discussion, so any questions maybe from the floor that you'd like to ask any, any of us?